Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents. I'm Jennifer Schonberger. More people are using cryptocurrencies to trade and invest and as a form of payment, but the industry remains largely unregulated, leaving consumers exposed and professional investors scratching their heads what to do. But two senators, Kirsten Gillibrand and Cynthia Lummis, are taking charge with the most comprehensive bipartisan legislation yet to regulate cryptocurrencies. And they join me now to talk about their forthcoming legislation. Senators, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you both with us. Thanks, Thanks Jennifer. Uh, Senator Lummis, if I could start with you. Your home state of Wyoming has been at the forefront of cryptocurrency adoption and regulation. What sorts of ideas, concepts have you gleaned from your home state's approach to parlay to a federal regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies? Wyoming passed a special purpose depository institution statute that would allow for uh, special institutions to custody uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, next step, after getting through all of the state regulatory process for state chartering, uh, was to go to the Fed for ABA bank routing numbers, uh, as well as uh, getting them approved for master accounts. That has proven to be a big problem. You're also seeing uh, cryptocurrency companies approach the SEC and uh, having delays in uh, getting approvals, uh, partly because there is not an adequate regulatory framework uh, that the regulators can use as a reference and the industry can use as a guideline. Uh, so that's among the reasons that Senator Gillibrand and I have joined forces uh, to create a comprehensive regulatory framework uh, for digital assets. And so how does your bill help solve for these issues? Well, it is truly comprehensive. Uh, we have a bill that uh, addresses uh, the regulatory framework by utilizing what's in place now. Uh, most cryptocurrencies are uh, commodities, uh, which would put them within the jurisdiction of the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission for trading spot markets uh, and futures markets. Uh, and then some, of course, are bundled into securities. They would have the Howey test would be applied, which is a case law test to help determine what's a security, uh, and then compliance uh, at the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, would follow. We have a standard set of definitions. Uh, we're addressing consumer protection, privacy, taxation, uh, as well as stable coins, uh, short references to a potential um, CDBC, uh, and uh, we're trying to create that opportunity to continue to innovate while having uh, the playing field more clearly deline, uh, delineated. Senator Gillibrand, I want to ask you about how you believe stable coins should be regulated. We've seen the Biden administration recommend that only banks should be allowed to issue stable coins. Uh, your colleague in the Senate, Senator Pat Toomey, is floating some draft legislation now um, that would formulate different kinds of oversight, including a new federal charter. Where do you stand on that? How would your bill solve for this? Uh, should they be required to have uh, depository uh, insurance? Should they have a direct line to the Federal Reserve? So I think stable coins are very different uh, than our um, dollar and they are they have very different uses. Uh, so the purpose is very important. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, OCC is probably a better overseer um, off of the currency uh, as opposed to uh, any other body. Um, they don't do the same things as banks and they're not intended to be banks. And so we don't want to regulate that market as if they're banks. They don't want it, we don't want to create so much cumbersome um, infrastructure around it because it's not necessary because the uses are very different and so we're going to look at um, the stablecoin industry uh, a little more holistically and I think at the end of the day we don't want to limit it so that only banks could participate in it for example mm -hmm. you want to be able to have it for multiple uses in multiple places so I think ultimately OCC would be a better overseer than the requirements that our banks have to go through because banks standards for safety and soundness are very different. Uh, banks standards um, and purposes uh, for people's savings, life savings and for other um, 
commercial and financial products are very different. So we don't want to limit the market by creating such oversight that a bank would have to um, uh, be able to be uh, under. So we want a different framework that I think is a little more flexible uh, and a little more, um, what's the word, uh, open to innovation mm -hmm. than we have today with banking regulations. Mm -hmm. Senator Lemus, want to ask you about consumer protections. To borrow a phrase from SEC Chair Gary Gensler, crypto is a bit like the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of standard consumer protections in place. So if an exchange is hacked, then there's a risk that you could lose your crypto. How would your forthcoming bill protect investors against losing crypto in the event of a hack? How would you ensure that consumers could access their crypto at any time they want and get their money back, especially if there's a lot of volatility in the markets? As you know, crypto can be quite volatile. Well, certainly the uh, exchanges uh, would be subject to regulation. Uh, people can have individual wallets, um, and if uh, Bitcoin is properly uh, uh, secure uh, in that wallet, um, investors can be uh, certain that they have access to their uh, digital assets. But uh, for people who are going through an exchange, it's going to be important that those exchanges have those very consumer protections of which you spoke. So uh, the bill we're drafting would provide for that. Uh, it would continue to look to the SEC uh, that has experience in consumer protection uh, to provide those thresholds for consumer protection uh, that will ensure that exchanges uh, are, are secure. Um, you know, the, the other issue that's really important with regard to consumer protection is that while uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum make up over 60% of all the digital assets that are held in uh, the world, there are somewhere between 17 and 18,000 uh, cryptocurrencies. A lot of those are fraudulent. And so among the things that we want to ensure is that fraudulent uh, cryptocurrencies uh, are meted out uh, and uh, the SEC has the tools it needs to ensure that consumers are protected from fraudulent crypto concerns, uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, Senator Lemus, I know you've been a longtime investor in Bitcoin. I have in my notes here that members of Congress have bought and sold an estimated 1.8 million worth of crypto-related investments since the beginning of last year. Mm -hmm. And I know, Senator Gillibrand, you have been pushing for a ban on stock trading by members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Should we have rules in place for lawmakers when it comes to trading and investing in crypto? Well, I'll just briefly say that um, I was the author of the Stock Act about 10 years ago, which required transparency. Uh, pri prior to that, people didn't even know that members of Congress could be prosecuted for insider trading. There was no previous case of it. Uh, the regulators were unsure they were allowed to, and there were some really egregious cases. And so we thought sunlight's the best disinfectant. So make sure that members of Congress have to disclose every time they buy or sell a stock so that the American people can have transparency and accountability. That has actually worked. Some people um, who have bought and sold stocks at certain times, they've been investigated for whether or not it was based on non-public information. Uh, some people have lost their elections over it because it just created an appearance of impropriety and they felt like, who is that person really working for? And so the Stock Act worked. Um, we want to upgrade it with the Stock Act 2.0, which will do a couple of things. Um, it will ban members of Congress from buying and selling stock because they just didn't do it very, they didn't, it didn't take care of the problem. All the people who bought and sell stocks has still created this unbelievable impression that they were still getting inside information. I think the statistic is, is that members of Congress stock portfolios perform exponentially higher than the average American. So there's all these data points that didn't make people feel comfortable. Um, but we are going to create some provisions for people who come into Congress owning certain portfolios that they can hold them in blind trust, um, create some measure of transparency and accountability where they can't change what they own uh, while they're in Congress. And so that's probably going to be the outcome. And then we want to make sure that other parts of our government are also held accountable. So the judiciary, uh, the Fed, and the executive branch and the White House. So it's important that 
if we do do this ban, it's across all layers of government. And then the last piece of it, which is equally as important, is if you do get benefits from being in Congress, when you're writing laws for, let's say, COVID relief, that members of Congress aren't first in line mm -hmm. to get those grants, because if they are, they at least need to disclose it, because the voters have a right to know. So under this, we would allow people to own what they own, but they would have to put it behind a blind trust. But that would include crypto? That's the draft that we have right now. Okay. And so, but this is being worked on by, mm, you know, a dozen members of Congress who care about these transparency issues. Mm -hmm. And so the final bill will be introduced, I think, at some point in the next few weeks. Okay. Senator Lemus, I want to ask you about tax provisions within this forthcoming legislation. Should there be a de minimis tax exemption for a certain level of capital gains for crypto investors? And if so, what should that threshold be? Well, right now our bill draft uh, has a de minimis ex exemption. Uh, we came up with a number $600 uh, just uh, to start out with. But uh, among the things that we're doing is sharing our bill draft with uh, a number of our constituents uh, so we can get feedback. Is 600 the right number? Should it be higher considering inflation uh, and, uh, and other factors? Yeah. So yes, we think there will be a de minimis exemption. I don't know what the amount will be. With regard to uh, other provisions uh, in, that relate to taxation in the bill, uh, it provides for mark to market for digital assets. Right now the accounting is such that mark to market isn't used, uh, so we want to clarify that. And there are several other uh, uh, provisions in our bill uh, that will relate to taxation. Mm -hmm. Any reason why crypto would kind of get this benefit versus other asset classes? For instance, if I own shares of Apple and I sell them at a gain, I would incur capital gains tax on that. It's basically the use and purpose. So imagine a kid owning some cryptocurrency in a game. You need to have a de minimis amount. That kid's not filing taxes. And if he has $40 worth of cryptocurrency to buy the sword in his next Minecraft game or his next whatever. <laughs> I mean, my children play all these. But um, you, you need to have the ease of the usage. It's, that's why these, um, this technology is why blockchain, it's why um, different token technologies and cryptocurrency technologies, we want to make it usable for the purpose and the use. And so a lot of these entities, they're not trying to be banks. They're not trying to be um, uh, broker dealers. They're not trying to be all of these uh, terms of art that we use in financial services. And so that's why the purpose is so important in our legislation and the usage is very relevant. And that's why this is not like owning a stock because you're not using your stock portfolio to play a computer game online. Um, and the other, way, the other thing that you have to be cognizant of is this technology is is creating platform, blockchain's creating a platform for multiple uses, from community organizing, to investing in the art community, to um, allowing NFTs to be traded and to be um, used as something of value, but this is always gonna stay as a digital asset. So it's a unique platform that we want to recognize as very different. But the exciting thing for both Cynthia and I is the applica applications are limitless and the opportunity for innovation is unbelievable. And so one of the things that our bill has is a commission. We're going to have a standing body that's going to be able to review issues of first impression that we haven't thought of yet or haven't been invented yet. So there's a constant regulatory review of this particular technology, this particular usage, this particular purpose, where is it best placed um, in the current regulatory scheme, regulatory scheme in America and figure out where it should go and advise Congress. Um, that's going to be essential so that we continue the flexibility and the ability to innovate um, as this market grows. And one of the biggest goals for Cynthia and I is to create a market here in America that can stay in America, that this investment and this growth can be part of the U.S. economy and that these people who want to innovate in this place can do so and have these basic parameters of uh, anti-fraud protections, consumer protection, safety and soundness. And so that's why this global baseline regulation is so important and so timely because this industry can go 
anyway right now. And we want to keep it in America, and we want to be able to compete with the world, and we want this place to be the safest place to engage in these technologies and these markets. And, and this idea was uh, Kirsten's idea, and I, I really like it because as uh, Bitcoin and other digital assets move from being a store of value to also being a means of payment, uh, it's going to be important that we fashion regulations that recognizes that dual purpose, yep. uh, which is something that stocks don't do right now. Right. And the other thing is, there's a lot of entities that are using blended, and I don't even know the better word, but they're using all of these technologies in one platform. They're, they're, they're giving tokens, and the tokens are being used as access to a marketplace, as access to a communications platform, as a way to organize, as a way to create access to capital for low-income communities. I mean, these technologies are being used in such diverse ways that it has, again, unlimited, absolute unlimited potential. And so we don't want to stifle that innovation. We want that, invitation, that innovation to have a safe place to grow and to um, build upon itself. Really quick, one sentence answer. Where are we leaning towards a central bank digital currency after we've been studying this? Um, I'd say uh, delay it when it comes around. Have it only relate to the central banks, both here and internationally, mm -hmm. and not be direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Um, our bill right now at least has a study about the Chinese yuan um, for their digital currency because we need to understand what the implications of that are going to be, uh, what that um, effect will have on U.S. markets, and really understanding what the Chinese usages actually will be because a lot of it is uh, arguably more intelligence gathering than anything else. So we yeah. need to understand it um, and so that's part of our bill as well so that we can inform ourselves about what's happening around the globe as we consider it ourselves. Senator Gillibrand, Senator Lemus, thank you so much to both of you for your insight. Please keep us posted on this bill's progress. Hope to speak with you both again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.